Bonjour. Hello. For over a year now, all over the world, people have been sharing the same major concern, their health. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, the scientific research community has been fully committed with epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists and virologists. They've all been on the front line and their work has enabled us to understand the seriousness and the contagiousness of the disease and to find um, solutions. Because this crisis has disrupted our lifestyles, other scientists already took center stage. They also took center stage, sociologists, econo economists and anthropologists working closely with actors of society and populations in general. But be, above and beyond this unprecedented mobilization in the fight against the virus, other scientists, such as political scientists and ecologists, have already also contributed to the public debate by stressing on two dimensions of the health crisis. On the one hand, this is a global crisis where the health of people in one country depends on the health of nations on the other side of the planet. Finding sustainable solutions to strengthen the resilience of our societies therefore requires long-term international collaboration. On the other hand, it's not only necessary to manage the pandemic and curb its impact on populations, but also to act upstream on the relationships between humans and their environment in order to limit the emergence of new infectious diseases. Because of these two dimensions, the many debates involving scientists have brought to light vocabulary that is new to a large part of society. Global health, planetary health, one health and eco-health are new terms. So in a world where information abounds, how do we get to grips with all of these new concepts and terminologies? How do we grasp today's issues in order to develop solutions for tomorrow? Well, let's start this program together by defining the terms before we go on to explore the ideas. Global health, one health, eco health, planetary health. For several decades and increasingly since the COVID crisis, scientists have been using a whole series of terms to discuss factors linking the health of all living beings. Our understanding of this issue is limited, and it might seem to be a matter for specialists, but in fact, it concerns us all. So, what does it really mean? And what purpose does it serve? Global health places a priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all people worldwide. One Health conveys the idea of a holistic approach to health and the need to consider all types of health. Revolving around the link between human and animal health, this concept has logically been promoted by veterinarians in view of people's close relationships with their pets. Eco-health. This approach is promoted by ecologists, and this time, plant health is clearly an integral part of the concept. Ecosystems are formed by a community of living beings interacting with their environment. Today, our ecosystems are impacted by industry, urbanization, transportation, overfishing, single crop farming practices, etc. Therefore, an eco-health-based vision revolves around the idea that the degradation of ecosystems has an impact on the exposure of human populations to the viruses, pathogens, and pollutants propagated in these environments, particularly via animal communities. Planetary Health Envisaging human health and planetary health as an indissociable whole is an approach that is often adopted by public health researchers who establish a link between the degradation of ecosystems and the vulnerability of human populations while taking account of the planet's limitations. It is now known that humans are creating massive opportunities for potential disease propagation by devastating natural reservoirs and building sprawling cities, effectively rolling out the welcome mat for any poor viruses that have exhausted their supply of hosts in a given area. In short, these concepts, despite their differences in factions, are essential because they approach health from a fresh, much less anthropocentric perspective. When we consider health as part of a human, animal, plant continuum, and even on the scale of all ecosystems on Earth, in water, the air, or soils, we take a completely different approach to disease control. Examples include caring for animals and plants to prevent the transmission of diseases, reflecting on ways to regulate meat markets and intensive livestock rearing in order to prevent the spread of diseases, Preventing the degradation of natural environments, such as deforestation, which creates new opportunities for contact between humans and animals. Envisioning a borderless approach to disease prevention. In short, by developing a clearer but less anthropocentric analysis of our role, by looking all around us, and by aiming to achieve one health for all and by all. Doesn't this concern us all?
Alors, vous l'avez compris, tous ces As you've understood, all of these terms converge within the same paradigm, i.e. the health of human beings is linked to the health of our planet and needs to be addressed in a holistic, integrated, interdisciplinary and cross-cutting way. Today's program is called One Health Wellness at Every Level, and that reflects this imperative. Health approached from an international perspective because pandemics are planetary, with the need to strengthen cooperation between countries in the North and the South health that considers not only the dynamics of diseases, the now famous R0, but also the dynamics of climate, ecology and society. And also health that is coordinated between the different actors in society, scientists, politicians, associations, financial backers and citizens. The goal of the Hello World programs produced by the IRD is to intensify the dialogue between scientists and other actors in society by presenting a diversity of viewpoints between disciplines, between experts, between countries in the South and in the North. Today, as for each of our programs, we have four segments illustrated by capsule reports and testimonials. And for each segment, I will have the honor of welcoming a number of choice guests to discuss the theme of One Health. For the Hello Science segment, we have two renowned guests, and they will lay the scientific foundations of the program. Peter Dadzak, he's a disease ecology expert at IPBES and is also president of the EcoHealth Alliance. Letitia adlani Jewel, who's an anthropologist at the IRD and who is in charge of uh, the Center for Health and Humanitarian Policy Research at the WHO. She'll be live at the end of the, of the program. Second sequence, hello, Africa and America. I will be uh, talking with Francine Toumi, who's a professor of immuno immunology at Maria Nugabe University in Brazzaville. And is also director general of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research and vice president of the African Academy of Sciences. And Gerard de Suzanne, who is professor of the Faculty of Vet Veterinary Medicine at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and is president of the Mexican Association of Conservation Medicine. For Hello Solutions, we will come face to face with a concrete One Health situation in Mexico. And for this, Gerardo will be accompanied by Benjamin Roche, who's a research director in ecology and evolutionary bi biology at the IRD, and co director with Gerardo of the El Dorado International Laboratory. Finally, during the final sequence, Hello Citizens, this is your sequence, you will be able to interact with our guests, so don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat column and we will try to get back to as many of them. So welcome to this second program in the Hello World series, One Health Special. And without further ado, let's launch into Hello Science. Bonjour, uh, mesdames et messieurs. C'est une grande honneur pour uh, votre invitation pour moi. Mais um, I will continue on in English, uh, not in my... Uh, very bad French. I, I want to talk now about the value of the science that we're going to talk about today. Um, and I think the real value of what this whole uh, um, uh, meeting is about is that we can help prevent things like COVID-19 from happening in the future. And whether we call this One Health, Planetary Health, Conservation Medicine or Eco Health, the, the fact that we understand the connections between the environment, between wildlife, livestock and people, and how microbes can move along those pathways is absolutely critical. And here I'm showing a picture of a bat. And the reason for that is that, as many of you know now, um, there is a strong uh, scientific evidence that COVID-19 is caused by a virus that originated in bats, um, like many viruses before it. And it seems very strange for us, um, you know, as we began hearing about this pandemic, that, that such a strange event can lead to a, a global shutdown of our economies and millions of people being affected and sadly dying, including, you know, loved ones that we've lost due to virus from a bat. It just seems very odd. Um, when we first heard about COVID-19, we heard about this market, the Huanan seafood market in in um, uh, Wuhan, which is a market that sells seafood, but also wildlife. Um, and it sells live wildlife as well as killed animals. And we know from SARS, which emerged uh, uh, in 2003, that these markets can be the source of, of new viruses. So that became the first suspicion. And when we look at the science that's been done on coronaviruses in the wild, 
Uh, what we find out is there are literally dozens, maybe hundreds or even thousands of these coronaviruses um, in wildlife in areas of rural Southeast Asia where people are living very traditional lives. And this is a picture of Yunnan province in uh, South China, where it's possible that, that SARS coronavirus 2 began its journey from bats into people. Um, when we go to these regions, we find caves. This is a, a limestone countryside full of caves. And inside these caves are bats. And um, this cave in particular, um, working with our Chinese colleagues, we found every single genetic element of the original SARS coronavirus in one cave. Um, so it tells us that SARS probably emerged in this region and got into this wildlife market system and exploded. And maybe that's how COVID began too. So how do we understand this and how can we use this to predict future pandemics and prevent them? Well, let's look at the mechanism. You know, we, we've um, worked for many years in these places and looked at how um, extensive the wildlife trade is in Southeast Asia and China. In fact, these are pictures on, on the right hand side and the left hand side of the same place, the Huanan seafood market. And what you can see are cages with live mammals that we know can carry coronaviruses inside the market. And a new report that came out just a few weeks ago said maybe as many as 30,000 live animals per year were shipped into Wuhan from farms that breed them for food. Now, eating of wildlife is a very traditional habit in Southeast Asia and all around the world. But what's happened over the past three or four decades is um, there's been a shift to produce these animals in farms, to farm wildlife um, in dense colonies and then ship them into markets live all across China and Southeast Asia. Uh, these animals are mixed between ones that are bred in captivity and ones that come from the wild. And that allows an opportunity for their viruses to cross over and explode and spread either through people or through animals into cities like Wuhan. And we think that's the most likely pathway that COVID-19 took from a bat into people in Wuhan and then led to the pandemic. So understanding this complex system requires every aspect of science that we heard about. It requires people working on wildlife in rural parts of the world. It requires people working with human behavior to understand why people do these things, why there's been a push to um, industrialize this, this wildlife trade that actually employed 14 million people um, in, in uh, 2016, uh, just prior to the outbreak and was worth over $70 billion, as we now know from the IPBES report. So these are uh, serious issues for the future. If we're going to prevent pandemics, we need to look at these high-risk activities and try and reduce them. In fact, this isn't just COVID. Um, every pandemic we can think of in the modern era are caused by pathogens that originate in animals. And they're caused by our activities driving us closer to animals and allowing these pathogens to get into our population. Everything from HIV AIDS, which we know uh, likely originated in chimpanzees in, in West Africa, through Ebola, Zika, SARS, and most strains of influenza have an animal connection. So this is critical to stopping the next pandemic if everyone prior to this emerged in the same way. When we analyze the causes of all of these pandemics and, and all of the emerging diseases that don't become pandemic but could have done, we find really two key issues. Uh, land use change, deforestation, urbanization, building roads into remote areas brings people into contact with animals for the first time and their pathogens. Expansion of livestock production in particular and intensification of that production creates perfect conditions for viruses to get into populations and spread. Add to that pollution, add to that the, the poverty that we see in many countries that drives rapid economic growth. And we understand what's going on and what's causing the underlying causes of these pandemics. In fact, we can do the science behind that and analyze these drivers and then fit them to maps of where we predict the next pandemic is most likely to come to. So here we have a tool we can use to actually get out there on the ground around the world 
into the places most likely to lead to the next pandemic. And you can see that Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, parts of Latin America, um, parts of, uh, of Central and West Africa are key hotspots. And we all know many examples of diseases that emerged. But don't forget Europe too. We see foodborne infections, we see um, antimicrobial resistance, and the US. So if we can understand our activities that lead to these, these uh, diseases, we can then get on the ground where they're likely to happen and get ready for them. But not only that, we found ways to predict um, how many unknown viruses there might be in wildlife that could emerge in the future of about 1.7 million unknown viruses of the type that can infect people. We predict that between 630 and 830,000 could emerge into our populations in the next 50, 100 years. So why don't we go out there and find them and get ready, you know, and create vaccines against them and therapeutics that would work in advance of them emerging? Why don't we get out there and work with the communities that have the closest contact with these animals and protect them and help them live lives that are healthier and, and, and uh, less risky so they can then protect us? This makes logic sense to me and many scientists. And I think this is why IPBES um, recently published a pandemics report to look exactly at these issues and try and understand what the policy measures are we can take to prevent them. And by the way, it's not just the misery of a pandemic we need to think about, it's the economic cost. We estimate about a trillion dollars a year maybe um, in cost of these outbreaks that we see over and over again, new diseases, old diseases, coming from animals into people through environmental change. And the large black shadow on the right of your screen is COVID-19, which in the end, when all is said and done, will probably cost the planet tens of trillions of dollars in economic loss, as well as the misery of morbidity and mortality. So with that level of impact, surely we should be spending money to prevent them, not just waiting for them to emerge, rushing to produce a vaccine, and while we wait for a vaccine, millions of people die. Yes, we need vaccines and drugs, but with that period of waiting is not sustainable if pandemics are emerging at a faster and faster rate, which we predict they are. Preventing pandemics, we estimate, could cost in the tens of billions of dollars, whereas the cost of them is in the trillion dollars annually, a 50 to one return on investment. Now, we don't know exactly how that's going to pan out, but we do know what we need to do. And step one is to get on the ground and do the science behind this. And that's what you're hearing about today. Step two is then to talk to our communities at risk and change behavior so we don't have these happening in the future. And step three is to talk to policymakers and get them to change policies that drive pandemic risk. You know, we can all play a part in this. And I think that's one of the key issues. We need to form these high level policy um, councils that I know the French government has been very actively involved in. We need to get a One Health approach to prevent pandemics. But I think more important than anything, we all need to play a role in this. From the scientists that you're hearing from today, working on these issues in, in places that are difficult to work in and very complex scientific challenges. Through the communities that are going to have to reassess their relationship with nature to reduce risk. Through to us, when we visit our markets and our supermarkets and when we buy clothes, we need to think about the choices we make. When we buy a winter jacket with a fur trim that comes from Asia, uh, from a wildlife farm and um, bred but from animals that can carry coronaviruses, we are part of the problem too. So what I'm saying today is we need to be part of the solution. And I think that's what you're gonna hear about next. So I wanna thank you for the invitation um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of today's uh, events. Cheers. Thank you very much, Peter. Huge thanks to you. We, you've been talking about complex systems. We've talked about human behavior as well. Um, in our program, what we want to do is draw a contrast be between Peter's point of view and an anthropologist's point of view with different types of analyses to come back on that, that uh, concept of One Health, which includes many disciplines. And uh, Letitia, our next guest, is going to talk about uh, this One Health context and uh, see how we can uh, broach it from the social sciences point of view. So let's listen to Letitia. 
Yes, it's true. When you're a researcher, you're interested in what's going on currently in public health and international public health of that. And when you do that, you can't help but ask the question with each new term, are we facing a fad or is it really a new uh, paradigm? And one has to think, when you're thinking of two of these terms which have been mentioned, One Health and Global Health, you have have to ask that kind of question. A first view, one would imagine that this is an intellectual project and an action that have been around uh, for some time, already present in a series of fields of intellectual leg legitimization, and they're currently being spruced up. There's a second way of interpreting what's going on at the moment. We note that this is a, a new approach, new approach to uh, so, uh, public health. Health is taken as global and also as a single entity, i.e. One Health. These are key words. They've become unavoidable. They're buzzwords as we might call them. There is uh, some consensus evolving. Let's take uh, a couple of uh, terms. The film was really interesting and it gave us a lot of information about that. There's one of the definitions which is often taken up. Uh, it was um, identified by Mark Nishter and he underlined that uh, health is um, an integrated approach to health, that uh, health is uh, when the events in one country will affect another country. So for global health, it's the same thing. There are so many definitions. Let me just uh, remind you of one definition. The concept is very old. It's already been around since 2011. There was a strategic document from the Foreign Affairs Department here in France, and it defined uh, a strategy for One Health and said it was an integrated approach to health that was anchored in stronger collaboration between human health, animal health, and taking the environment into account. So you've got global health, one health. These are concepts that uh, have been around for some time already. And above and beyond the range of definitions that are given to those terms, you can come back to two shared characteristics which uh, transpire. First of all, they go beyond borders. So they're transnational, and that uh, is, uh, is exacerbated by the amount of people who are traveling around and uh, techniques also. And this uh, is a transnational dimension to it. If you're familiar with the history of uh, public health, this uh, fresh talk about transnationalism is, is not really a new topic. You can think back to when the WHO was created back in 1948, and it was uh, claiming it was going to govern world health. There's uh, another example, the Declaration of Alma Ata in 1978, it was a universal dogma, including primary health care. A second thing which they have in common is they want to rise to new security threats or health security threats. And uh, uh, we've, in the past, we've had HIV, SARS, bird flu, H1N1, and now COVID-19, of course. So clearly, this strengthens uh, our need and our desire to uh, produce a, a worldwide approach to uh, health crises. And uh, we need to we need to face these new health threats. So to conclude. So these are two complementary concepts. They're not really that new. But they are absolutely necessary today particularly after the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, we're all still going through. But they should not uh, make us forget the longer history, the longer story, that of public health care. Regularly, there have been uh, evolutions, and we have these two new concepts here. There have been fresh attempts to uh, rebuild public health care. Rebuilding public health care is essential, both naturally 
and internationally. We've seen that with COVID-19. And uh, there is a new mission that has been founded to try and redesign French public health care. Uh, the French Minister of Health uh, is working on it and is about to make an uh, announcement any day now. So there are many projects on the drawing board, but I'd like to come back to one of these projects. It's a tiny, tiny project, uh, very ambitious, but it's a small-ish project. It focuses on one specific subject, and um, that is the traces and the memories of the pandemic uh, in France, also internationally, uh, in Africa specifically. So this is an initiative that has been transformed into an institute. It's called the Institute COVID-19 Ad Memoriam. It's by, uh, promoted by the IRD and uh, Paris University, and it wants to collect, archive, analyze, all kinds of um, uh, memories dedicated to the pandemic in order to construct what we would like to call a, a digital memorial, if you like, dedicated to the pandemic, to help prepare for further health crises. So our institute is founded on a very strong partnership, or several partnerships, in fact. We've got many partners. We are working with major research uh, institutions here in France, INSERN, CNRS, Science Po, the Institute, the Pasteur Institute. There are health um, organizations, the WHO, very uh, heavily involved, but also French National Health Service and uh, the CCNE, etc. Et we are also working with victims' associations, representatives of civil society such as ADT, Carmonde, and we're also working with a lot of uh, professionals from the uh, law sector, we're working with religious communities and with the art and culture sectors. So we really want to uh, reach well beyond the realms of academia for this institute. Uh, which aims to help harvest all traces and all memories of the pandemic. So there are individual traces and memories, the testimonials, individual testimonials of different uh, uh, ways you've been through the, the pandemic. Whatever your experience may be, whichever country you may be in, photos, videos, music, written documents, and also collective memories. Uh, let me give you three examples. The Pasteur Institute has uh, is going to uh, give us its memories of uh, research into uh, COVID-19 and also launch a huge two-year survey surveys on anthropology, sociology, etc., with uh, oral archives, uh, photos, documents, etc., etc. And also there's another example. Uh, Paris City Hall has decided to launch a huge survey on the Parisians' uh, memory of uh, COVID. So there are all kinds of participants. The Federation of French Public Hospitals is uh, also involved, uh, a partnership, again, to collect testimonials and experiences from the healthcare workers those who were involved in caring for COVID-19 patients. And we're going to replicate the same initiative in two sub-Saharan Africa, Burkina Faso and Ghana. Other examples, and I'm going to round up with this, uh, our institute wants to collect and analyze all of these traces and memories, but we also want to um, produce commons and shared reflections, uh, organize seminars and conferences. Um, all of the information will be on the Institute's uh, website. And we want to help invent new commemorative practices. They could be tribute days, for example. Uh, that might happen in Paris, for example. Or celebrating uh, the, the health care staff with uh, the hospitals. So, so facing this uh, global risk, we uh, have to work together. And as we like to say at our institute, going through an experience without telling others about it is to betray it. Well, that was a, 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 major, a major report from Letitia. She is talking about that One Health concept, how it will involve a huge panel of disciplines. We saw that with Peter also, with the ecology of uh, illnesses. We're going to look at anthropology now, a little bit more uh, psychology to prepare the next crisis. We all have to know where 
where the next uh, crisis is going to break out, we have to prepare our collective memory and the society's memory. So we really see the interaction that is necessary between the different researchers, thanks to those two presentations. Now we're going to move on to the second se sequence. It's called Hello Africa and America. So, to start this sequence, we are going to look at an EPOC um, section. It's a participation between ERD, IRD and uh, Plant Info. And we are going to, first of all, hear the testimonial of a fisherman from the town of uh, Bukalu, which is... Uh, uh, well, he's got plenty of things to sell us, and he is going to say how these populations are subjected to um, different problems, and uh, the uh, film was made by Expedit Kialu. Ile makati uchafu wa ibukwaka ibukwaka mayalala ile makati zamani meme hata huko msoko ya brasiri uchafu ilikuwa ya milimili sana hiyo uchafu ilikuwa hapa brasiri juu ya kuposa fasi ya kwa uchafu ni ile uchafu inatokana na na wenyu wanauzisha tu msoko leta majani mayani ya, ya mashu ya malenga lenga na vingine tu hii zina ya kufanya pombe Kuinaleta maguchafu, tuseme ili arufu, na mule mumatanki yao mnatoka arufu sana, na ili arufu ili hende napanda, hati niweza ingia hata kuchafu na kufuwa kufuwa. Ile uchafu yao ni o ize, ndaba kai fanziwa izine sasa hapa, pembeni ya soko, ili arufu yao peke na deranja kabatu sana sana, inafika hata mumakartie. Kwanza mpaka hivi niko naona sawa ndo inyiku na uwa batu mwa hii kartie, huku batu manapata maleria, Kichwa inaluma mtu anakufa directe ile sote na ushia inatengeneza mabinini ile natumaga mchafu mule mu maji mulaki kwa sama hata samaki zinakufaka hata mulaki kwa kuwa hali inaweza kuwa mzuri zaidi sawa vile merile kama motogari kama itakuwa inasomba hii uchafu tusaidie si population kwanza batujengia hata hata dispa dispensary moto wetu napata madawa kwa watoto wako na gonjwa na mazeba na gonjwa tunaona sawa ni jere bichafu yake ya kunuka mimi sawa mkaji wa brasiri na mimi nakubalia brasiri mimi penda population ya brasiri ijikaze kwa kufanya salo wa kusudi tusipate magonjwa Alors le saut peut paraître énorme entre les présentations de Peter et de Laetitia. But uh, in fact, the reality on the ground and the complexity on the ground is really something that researchers are faced with, in particular researchers working on ecology and social matters. So we are going to hear from Leticia who will react to this uh, testimony and tell us how uh, this can be studied uh, by social science. This film is uh, reminding us that at the IRD, uh, there's researchers working uh, on health matters, but also on social sciences. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'm thinking of development sociology, uh, development anthropology researchers at the IRD working on issues like the governance of urban waste in Africa. And this work can illustrate uh, what uh, social sciences can bring uh, in terms of insights on these topics. For instance, a study was done in 2005 by a geographer called Elizabeth Doria April and Cecilia Menet, so two geographers, and they studied the transformation of urban waste management in Mali and Benin. 
And the study showed that the influence of local governance models that were promoted by uh, development funders uh, was developed in two uh, stages. First of all, the support of multilateral agencies was conditional to the uh, to making local services leaner, and which meant making waste management professionals redundant. But then during the second stage, these development bodies supported local NGOs who were tasked with replacing the action of municipal services. And sometimes the, um, these NGOs were custom made, and some of them actually included professionals who had been made redundant by the previous municipalities. So these NGOs were able to adapt to an ever-changing context. But uh, this, uh, this uh, delegation of waste management systems has been has sometimes been uh, referred to as uh, shared management. There are issues with disagreements and competition between NGOs, commercial services, and local authorities. And in this context, uh, this conflict, uh, in the context of this conflict, they were questioning the resilience of municipal services when uh, they are faced with these tensions between international bodies and local authorities. So this gives you an example of how in the sector of public health, health and more specifically looking at the management of urban waste in Africa, social sciences and specifically uh, sociology, geography, political science, anthropology, development policies can really help improve our understanding of what's happening uh, today in uh, the, the kind of situations that we've seen in the film. So uh, the ER, IRD has a long history of working on these topics. Yes, what's important is in Leticia's uh, testimony is that we need to look at the causes of the problems. Uh, the One Health approach has been um, envisaged from the perspective of waste, but we need to look at social and political factors so as to look at the causes of these issues. So Peter, uh, what, how do you feel uh, looking at the testimony of this fisherman and looking at the complexity of these health issues? Yeah, what I see in this video is what I see in almost every country we work in, um, which are, are communities that understand what's going on, that they know that there's a problem. They see it every day. They live in, in the problem. They see that, the, that, um, that somehow pollution and um, disease are connected and the health of their own uh, communities is at risk. Um, we also, you know, it, it's easy to see that and say, that's terrible. Why isn't the government doing something? Well, the government is challenged with not enough funding. Um, uh, uh, they don't, they can't see the direct connection uh, sometimes. And they don't have the science to act on sometimes. So I think that what, what this really tells me is there's, there's a key role for science, uh, for, the, for the One Health approach, for the Eco Health approach, to get out to these places on the ground try and understand the problem to put measure the, the issue and to find the connections between pollution, um, community behavior, all the way to health outcomes. And if we can show that those connections to policymakers, they're going to be more willing to spend the budget, the limited budget they have on that issue. And if we can talk to the community leaders and, and get them to allow us into their communities to work with them, we're gonna get much better signs done on how these issues are happening on the ground. That's the sort of work that needs to happen. I think there's going to be um, a, a deep, deep need for this as we build out of COVID and we try and prevent future pandemics. As we look at places around the world that are still suffering from COVID um, when we become fully vaccinated because they don't have access to healthcare the same way that we do. And we recognize, and I think everyone on the planet recognizes now that we're all connected and that whatever, what happens in countries a long way from where we're based will, will has a potential to affect all of us. So I do see some really big lessons for us and especially a role that scientists can play as advocates for policy measures, as people who understand a complex problem and can show a policymaker, a politician, a, a manager of the, the resources to deal with it exactly what that problem is.
Merci beaucoup, Peter. Je voudrais maintenant continuer. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I would now like to move on uh, with this uh, conversation between Congo and Mexico. Uh, so I'll hand over to Fran Francine and to me. Thank you, Francine, for joining us. What uh, is? How do you feel about this testimony? Merci beaucoup. Alors, ce témoignage pour moi est très parlant parce que ce témoignage pour moi est très parlant in many other countries, also in Africa, for example. We've got uh, an association uh, that uh, works on this. We, population is noticing that there's nothing happening. We are waiting for funding from outside sources. It's really important, as was underlined by Letitia and Peter, and this is the involvement of anthropologists, local anthropologists. We don't see them very much. Even during COVID, we hardly saw any of them helping to answer to uh, the questions about this crisis. So they are so important. This uh, scientific discipline is, is pushed to one side here in Africa, and we really have to make sure that these uh, players do play their role in public health to enhance the governance of waste. So that's what uh, I feel when I saw that film. Uh, so we really must think about our anthropologists and include them. Thank you very much, Francine. I'm going to ask the same question to Gerardo from Mexico. We've just seen a testimonial there in the Congo. There's a problem of contamination. Does that, does that speak to you, to situations you see? Hello. Yes, it is very important. Uh, in Mexico, we have uh, similar problems, all distributed all over the country. And, and we have uh, health problems associated to industries. A lot of heavy metals are wasted into the lakes, into the water. And also uh, industry and, and, and food markets and, and the microbial resistance is provided everywhere. But interestingly, in Mexico, there are a lot of uh, uh, ministries who are working independently, for example, a ministry is working on, on monitoring air pollution in Mexico, and they have very interesting data. There are other ministries, for example, monitoring uh, pollution in soil, other ministries monitoring diversity, laws, other ministries. But the important thing is that the one whole concept, concept has been uh, in the field but in fact, there is not a, a, a connection between different ministries. So there are a lot of waste of money on investing on, on how the problem is, but there are not uh, integrated solutions. So we need to, to do more uh, collaborative work between ministries and scientists to provide different stuff. For example, this is an example of how the water pollution is uh, all over Mexico, and you have the quality of water, and it's monitoring every week, every week, every week, so we have interesting data, but there are not a collaborative work to provide a base solutions and, and, and important solutions for health. So I guess this is a, a thing that is missing in Mexico. Thank you very much, Geraldo. Yes, this problem of silos, uh, scientists know that, but also in ministries we encounter the same problems. This is something which we have to solve together. I'd like to come back now to you again, Francine, to ask you another question, more a broader question. You are general manager of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research, and I would like to ask you, with regards to what we heard at the beginning of the program, the One Health concept, uh, an, eco eco an ecologist and an anthropologist were talking about it. So what does uh, your foundation do and how can it be placed within the One Health uh, arena? Well, our uh, foundation for research medical, med medical research um, supports uh, local train or national training courses in uh, the area of medical. We carry out um, research activities on infectious diseases for the country. Uh, we do a lot of training also and we also carry out advocacy for research. As far as One Health is concerned, our foundation since 2018 has been coordinating a, a Pandora project. It's a pan-African project. It involves many institutions. Uh, uh, four European Euro countries are also involved with nine African uh, countries. And we want to prepare our response to epidemic 
pandemics and to prepare for them and to respond to them. So in terms of activities since 2018, we have uh, been working in Nigeria. Chikungunya, of course, was uh, in the Congo and COVID, uh, just to name a couple of uh, diseases. And we were very, very involved working with the communities, getting the communities on board. On board, so we could benefit from our colleagues in the north who had experience, who would come with us to, to support other countries. And there's been joint projects with the World Health Organization, local NGOs, international NGAs, uh, many that uh, that I could mention. All that we have done has to line up with uh, uh, global efforts. The most important thing in terms of research is to provide the basic data, because sadly, a lot of our countries simply do not, well, countries here in Africa I'm referring to, we do not have the basic data about certain diseases and infections that can turn into epidemics. So our role is to provide reliable data so that authorities can then use that data to uh, uh, prepare their response. So those are the key points that I wanted to point out about our foundation. And the concept of One Health is really important. And something else I'd like to underline is that, uh, that uh, social aspects, uh, that society is not included in the response. That really has to uh, uh, cease. Also, the, the vets, we have very few vets who are involved in our research activities. And we realized here again that we have to do a lot of work to get the vets on board, and that's what we're going to do with our Pandora network. Merci beaucoup, Francine. Thank you very much, Francine. And uh, Gerardo will be with you again later on in uh, the uh, program. It's so important, as you just said, how important it is to have different disciplines interacting, how important uh, reliable data is. We'll uh, look at that in our Hello Solutions section. So, to start the Hello Solutions sequence, I'm going to suggest to you we take a look at an interview of a, a woman who is fighting and has been fighting for several years to better understand the uh, interaction between politics and health. Her name is uh, Marie-Monique Robin. She is a journalist and she has just published a book all about pandemics and protecting biodiversity for the good of planetary health. And uh, she is talking about how important it is uh, for the public to be aware of it. So, let's hear what she has to say. Le cœur de, ce, de cet ouvrage, c'est donc d'explorer le lien entre la biodiversité et la santé, et en particulier avec l'émergence de nouvelles maladies infectieuses. C'est un livre de confinement que j'ai réalisé en, en interviewant 62 scientifiques issus des cinq continents. L'ouvrage est fondé sur ces entretiens, mais aussi sur toutes les études qui ont été réalisées par ces scientifiques. Pour moi, ça a été une expérience très forte d'interroger tous ces scientifiques. J'étais aussi impressionné par le fait qu'ils avaient tous envie de parler parce qu'ils étaient assez déprimés. Je me rappelle, c'était pendant le printemps donc 2020, hein, pendant le premier confinement, euh, bah, déprimés de voir ce qui se passait, quoi, parce que quelque part, ils se disaient, bah, on savait que ça allait se passer, et on ne nous a pas écoutés. Et donc, ils avaient vraiment envie de communiquer leur savoir, leur connaissance. Donc, euh, c'était un échange très intense. Ce livre est sorti en février donc, euh, 2021. Et je suis très heureuse parce qu'on vient de passer les 30 000 exemplaires euh, vendus. Donc, ça veut vraiment dire que c'est un sujet encore méconnu et qui suscite un intérêt euh, euh, important. Mon métier, c'est d'être une passeuse, hein, c'est de transmettre. Et, et donc, ça a évidemment une fonction sociale, hein, c'est-à-dire, euh, euh, moi, je pense que le, le rôle des journalistes, c'est d'informer pour que les citoyens et citoyennes puissent agir ensuite en ayant en main toutes les informations validées. Donc effectivement, on peut considérer que c'est un rôle de lanceur d'alerte. Les scientifiques de ce livre sont des lanceurs d'alerte aussi, dans la mesure où, euh, ils ont mis au jour des mécanismes extrêmement importants qui sont pour l'instant ignorés et qu'en plus ils ne sont pas entendus, donc ce sont des lanceurs d'alerte. Je soutiens aussi ceux que j'appelle les lanceurs d'avenir, c'est-à-dire ceux qui montrent qu'on peut faire autrement et qu'on doit faire autrement. Et que si on le fait, eh bien, ça sera 
bon pour tout le monde. C'est aussi ce que préconisent les scientifiques de, de mon livre de, ou du film. Hein. Ils parlent d'une du, science des solutions, justement. Ils disent, euh, vraiment à l'unanimité, hein, quel que soit le continent où ils sont installés, ils disent, euh, on ne peut plus faire la science euh, euh, ou faire de la recherche comme on le faisait au XXe siècle, n'est-ce pas Et On a des enjeux énormes que nous devons collectivement euh, relever. Il faut avoir une vision holistique, globale, hein, qui permette de reconnecter tous les enjeux ensemble. Et, et bien, donc aussi, ça veut dire qu'on euh, encourage une, une science euh, pluridisciplinaire, on fait intervenir euh, les compétences euh, qui peuvent être d'excellence hein, dans chaque discipline, pour trouver des solutions à ces défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés. So citizens like Marie Monique are of course part of the solution. There are people who are at the interface between researchers and the general public to really disseminate our knowledge. Uh, we are now going to discuss a specific case in Mexico, an international mixed laboratory that's been developed by IRD, and we're going to talk to the two co-directors of this lab, Gerardo, who was with us earlier and whom we've seen in Marie Monique's uh, documentary, and Benjamin. Uh, Gerardo, I would like to uh, I would like you to, to introduce very briefly the objective of your lab and what it does in Mexico. Hello. Well, this is a, a multidisciplinary collaboration. We have been collaborating for a long time, and develop, we developed this project called Ecosystem Biological Diversity Habitat Modifications and Risk for Emerging Pathogens and Diseases in Mexico. This is a collaboration between French and the French and the Mexicans here. And our objective, basic objective is to, to develop conservation strategies and at the same time develop a, 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 a health uh, uh, prevention, uh, risk uh, this, of diseases prevention to work together between conservation and protection of health. So the three main objectives were is are uh, improving our knowledge of, on the relationship between ecosystem alteration, human behavior, and risk of emerging zoonotic infections, providing scientific base and integrative strategy for public health and environmental authorities combining human health, biodiversity, conservation, and economic growth to a format sustainable development policies. And setting a strong regional capacity building strategy to make Mexico a regional and, and world leader on these issues through the collaboration with the IRD and creating a new center at the UNAM campus. This is a multidisciplinary, a multi uh, host approach, a multi pathogen approach, a multi vector approach. So it's an integrated uh, program uh, with different disciplines uh, sociologists, anthropologists, ma mathematicians, uh, veterinarians, biologists. And also involved with the uh, sectories, with the public health se sectories, the animal health se sectories. So we are uh, identifying different pot plots in, in, in all over the peninsula of Yucatan in the southeast Mexico, and identifying different drivers for, for infectious diseases and how these uh, changes uh, in landscape changes are shaping the assemblages of species and providing the risk for, for humans. So the interesting thing about this project is that we are collaborating with different institutions, with different international and national institutions, and at the same time developing a, 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 an academic program, program to, uh, to graduate program to work uh, with uh, national, uh, with Mexicans, but also with people from other countries, from Latin America, from the Caribbean, to integrate the collaborations between professors, students, and working directly with the field uh, and replicating these, uh, these uh, study sites and the methodologies in different countries in some way to making a, a web and to prepare, uh, to provide information and at the same time educating the, and inside uh, working with, uh, uh, with public and, and the government to provide new solutions for conservation and for health. That's the idea of the main uh, project of the El Dorado. 
Merci beaucoup, Gerardo, pour ce, cette mise en contexte. On va justement Thank you, Gerardo, for this uh, information. We're going to look a bit further into uh, relations with the public. Uh, I will now hear from Benjamin Roche, who's the co-director of CLMI. Uh, what are the concrete angles of research that you're pursuing at the LMI? The idea, as Gerardo said, was to uh, really understand the connections between human activities, degradations of the environment, and the uh, increased risk of zoonotic infections. So we want to test how uh, conservation strategies, such as banning deforestation or developing uh, more reasonable forms of agriculture, can impact the level of exposure for human populations, their exposure to zoonotic uh, pathogens. Uh, the idea for the LMI is to bring a scientific proof of concept that a good management of ecosystems can reduce zoonotic risks without uh, damaging the productivity of local populations. Because uh, when uh, you, we are working in the Yucatan, which is one of the poorest regions in Mexico, if we tell them that this intensive agriculture model can bring about new pandemics in 15 or 20 years time, they might tell us that they need to uh, make a living today. So we need to find the best compromise and the best environmental protection compromise that can be implemented in a sustainable manner. Because we're not talking about a vaccine where you get your jab and you're protected. Uh, we're talking about long-term strategies that will need to be implemented over several decades. So uh, what really matters, and that's one of the positives of the project, is to show that this type of strategies can be implemented, which is why we're working with health agencies, with the Yucatan state, with the Mexican federal government, uh, to ensure that Yucatan becomes the first example of a territory where a preventative uh, One Health strategy has been implemented to reduce the emergence, emergence of zoonotic infections in the future. So we want to uh, bring an example, a concrete proof of concept that this type of preventative strategy can work and can be implemented over the long term. Uh, you mentioned uh, your interactions with the local populations. So scientists are thinking very hard to figure out how to better disseminate their findings in their work with local populations. We're going to look at an example that's been developed by CIRAD in partnership with IRD and OIE and other GMRs in Montpellier to try and create new approaches to interact with these populations. This is called a serious game. Let's look at it now. Alors pourquoi un jeu sérieux? Parce que on sait que l'on retient 10% de ce que l'on nous dit, mais on va retenir 80% de ce que l'on va expérimenter. Donc l'objectif pour nous c'était de, de créer un outil euh, facile d'utilisation sur le terrain et qui permette aux gens d'expérimenter qu'est-ce qu'une chaîne de surveillance afin de mieux comprendre d'une part euh, la complexité dans le système de surveillance mais aussi que les acteurs comprennent bien leur rôle, leur responsabilité et leur place dans ce système et qu'ils puissent prendre les mesures de contrôle, les actions adéquates pour éviter la propagation d'une maladie et limiter son émergence. Donc c'est un jeu collaboratif destiné aux acteurs des systèmes de surveillance et donc l'objectif est de limiter la propagation d'une maladie en reconstruisant une chaîne de surveillance. Donc on commence à un point et on doit limiter la propagation de cette maladie. Donc il y a une première carte qui est tirée au sort, en l'occurrence là c'est un éleveur qui observe attentivement son troupeau pour identifier des signes suspects de maladie. Et donc les joueurs doivent reposer les cartes qu'ils ont en main en fonction de cette première carte et en, pour reconstruire la, la chaîne de surveillance. Donc la première carte que j'ai là, c'est un éleveur qui découvre des morts inexpliquées d'animaux sauvages et qui s'inquiète pour ces animaux. Et donc le joueur choisit de placer sa carte avant ou après, euh, après la carte euh, au centre. Et ensuite, quand il a discuté avec l'ensemble des joueurs, euh, retourne la carte pour voir s'il l'a bien placé. Donc là, on peut voir que les chiffres ne se suivent pas. Donc le, il y a eu une erreur. La carte aurait dû être placée ici. Et donc, quand euh, ils se sont trompés, on a, on augmente, euh, le risque de propagation augmente d'une case. Donc le deuxième joueur prend une carte. Là, c'est la carte chef de poste eau et forêt qui alerte la direction des parcs nationaux et la direction régionale de l'environnement. Donc euh, choisis de le poser après la carte éleveur, la retourne et effectivement euh, c'est euh, la bonne position. 
Donc on se rend compte que la chaîne de surveillance est respectée parce qu'on suit les numéros, mais aussi euh, on voit qu'il y a différentes couleurs parce qu'on on, on, on partage de l'information du niveau local jaune au niveau national violet. Et donc on a les différentes euh, cartes des différents niveaux qu'on positionne ensuite au fur et à mesure du jeu et on voit bien à la fin que la chaîne de surveillance est respectée, c'est-à-dire que les, les acteurs partagent de l'information sanitaire euh, avec les bonnes personnes, ce qui permet d'agir dans les temps et de limiter la propagation de la maladie. Donc l'objectif maintenant c'est de déployer le jeu de, sur le terrain pour renforcer les systèmes de surveillance et pour la recherche, collecter des données pour mieux comprendre l'organisation de ces systèmes de surveillance. Oui, alors l'idée c'est vraiment de mettre en œuvre ce jeu dans le cadre de formations collectives, du local au national, et on espère aussi que les acteurs s'approprient le jeu pour pouvoir jouer de manière autonome. Alors une idée de jeu, je voulais so poser la question à Gérard. This que, uh, sounds like a great game. Uh, Gerardo, you are the president of the Mexican Association for Conservation and you do a lot of work with local populations. So what do you think about this game? Do you think this could be a potential solution? And do you have any more tips that you would like to share uh, to communicate with local populations? Hello. Well, this is very, very interesting uh, uh, game and this is an important way to send messages all over the, the population. And this, this creative way of working has been developed, for example, in, in Mexico, in different ministries for preventing some diseases, to develop some vaccination programs, to develop some eradication of exotic species. But they have been, as I mentioned before, in isolated silos, working uh, alone. So what I think is needed, this kind of games to to show the, the way to, to collaborate together, to prevent, to monitor, to research different uh, risks, to potential risks for the population, but at the same time working in, in different institutions to, to develop new ways to, to work together. And this one whole concept it could be very, very important issue to, to work in a new way of, of working in, in, in different aspects. So we don't have so far this integrated way, but I guess this is very nice, nice way of doing it. Thank you, Gerardo. So we've seen how important it can be to work with local populations. We've seen the uh, political dimension. Now we're going to look at a more global dimension to deliver ambitious products on a global scale, projects on a global scale. A few months ago, uh, there was the One Planet Summit where uh, we took, uh, where the French President of the Republic took a very active part to support the Prezod Initiative. I would like to mention that our One Planet Summit is an opportunity to launch the Prezod initiative, which uh, involves the French research sector on the prevention of the emergence of future zoonotic diseases. Uh, the president uh, mentioned this initiative earlier, and she highlighted the European commitment in this project. Uh, in our attempt to better coordinate uh, European research. One Health needs to coordinate our global agendas. The Prezod initiative will support the consolidation of monitoring networks in terms of human, animal and environmental health in order to identify and reduce risks uh, working in collaboration with the states uh, involved. I would like to thank the European Commission and FAO for their strong involvement in their initiative as well as the different research research bodies who've been involved uh, in designing this initiative. Benjamin, you are one of the architects of the Prezod initiative. Can you tell us a bit more about the science behind Prezod? Yes, the idea is to really scale up the work that's been done uh, by the various One Health projects that are being developed throughout the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, highlighted the fact that the impact of human activities is going to be 
increasing the uh, pr probability of emergence of zoonotic diseases and potentially pandemics. So we want to be scaling up uh, what we've presented uh, with Gerardo in Mexico. And what we uh, will be, uh, our um, findings in Me Mexico can be applied to other similar ecosystems. Uh, we cannot act uh, to prevent the emergence of zoonoses in the same way in Yucatan or in Asia or in Africa. Uh, every time there's a specific context we need to take into account, an environmental, evolutive, social and sanitary context that we need to take into account. We need to develop prevention methods that are fully integrative. So far, uh, our, uh, preparing for pandemics involved waiting for the microbe to hit human populations and then try to control it. We've seen with COVID-19 that this wasn't a very uh, helpful solution and that this needed to be supported by prevention strategies that work upstream of the emergence. So Prisod is working to improve the monitoring of the interface between humans and animals, but also to find ways of managing ecosystems to uh, mitigate the risk of emergence of zoonoses. Uh, one very important point in Prisod is, as we've seen in Mexico, these strategies need to be implemented on the ground. They mustn't be uh, limited to conceptual exercises, which is why this initiative developed by INRA Sirad IRD is developed in collaboration with stakeholders in all the countries where Prisod is being deployed. Uh, Eleven countries are involved, and we want to work with academics, health authorities, local authorities to really develop a roadmap for a project that is as uh, easy to implement as possible to respond to the needs. This truly is an international initiative. It's been launched by France, but it is uh, fully international. At uh, the uh, international conference that launched Prisod in December, uh, 400 researchers from 50 countries were present, which shows that there really is international interest in this initiative. Uh, of course, at the moment, we are focusing on Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia is not the only uh, risk area. In 2006, uh, when H5NA uh, uh, emerged, uh, Mexico was the uh, place from which the pandemic really started. So we really need to develop this global effort and to work in coordination to develop our effort uh, and prevent zoonotic disease emergence. Thank you, Benjamin and Gerardo, for this presentation. Uh, you will be staying with us for the Q&A session, but uh, to finish, I wanted to go back to our guests, Peter and Francine, to ask for their reactions on what you've presented, uh, these very local solutions and this political impulse that we all need. Francine, what do you think of this concrete example? Well, uh, it's very inspirational hearing all of this. It seems strangely similar to what we're doing here in the Congo. As you know, Central Africa really is a zone where uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, recurrent epidemics, Ebola, just to mention that one. And we are currently putting in place a similar construction, a collaborative project with WCS uh, to conserve of biodiversity to ensure that uh, the locals don't uh, damage local biodiversity. And so they have become eco-guards. So the, a partner t is looking after the fauna, another team is looking after the flora, and another team is looking after the human element. So we are currently moving forward together. And it really is, it echoes exactly what I've just heard here, what Benjamin has just been talking about. And I really do hope that uh, we will be able to uh, take advantage of the tools that are going to be created by this wonderful initiative. But it's very inspirational, and uh, it, uh, depending on the context, I'm sure we'll be able to uh, embrace it and uh, work closely with the populations and the uh, health or health authorities as well. Thank you, Francine. Yes, a great South-South project coming up there. Let's hand the floor to Peter now to wrap up. So this political impulse is so very important to see this kind of combat through. Peter, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Sorry. No, I am. Um, I. Uh... Completely agree. I think that one of the things we're seeing here is the connection between science and society. You know, when in the IPBES pandemics report, we, we tried to make science relevant to policy, but we also need to make it relevant to the community. We need to work with people who are right there in, in the middle of all of this and, and explain what the value is to them. Each person is different. Each person sees, has a different view of biodiversity. To some people, um, there are threats in biodiversity, including animals that raid their crops, that, that um, they're constantly fighting a battle with. So we need to work with everybody to understand what motivates them and, and then how we can, we can get the message across to them of the value of what we're trying to do. So, I, you know, I look at it a bit like this. Um, you know, if we see a, a friend and we want to introduce them to the beauty of nature, we don't say, hey, Go into the forest and look at nature. It's wonderful. No, we say, come with me. Let's take a walk together and let's go and look at the beauty of nature and the, the reason and the value. We have to put in the work as well. And I think that's what we're seeing with some of these projects, whether it's designing a, a clever game that brings um, fun into this issue, whether it's working with a community and spending time with them to really understand their needs or whether it's going and sitting through hours and hours of policy meetings with politicians so you can show them the value of the work you're trying to do. We've all got to play our part. And I really do see a very positive and optimistic view because of exactly the sorts of projects we've heard about today. I really think that in 50 years time, people will look back and say, you know, the world was a real mess. We have climate change, we had pollution, we had poverty. And, we, and one of the outcomes of that were pandemics that happened more and more often. And finally, we woke up and we all recognize the threat that these things represent and that dealing with them is going to bring some short term pain and, and uh, it's going to cost us something. But the long term is a much more positive, enjoyable and richer future for all of us. And that's what we've got to work towards. Thank you, Peter, for this message of hope. And thank you, Francine, uh, waking up. I think this is uh, what uh, the message we will keep. Uh, now, hello, citizens. So we are now entering into our final sequence. It's called Hello Citizen. So uh, Letitia has joined with us. She's live with us here. So we have five speakers with us now. This is your sequence. We're going to collect your questions. We've already got several questions. Delphine, have there been many questions on the chat column? Yes, hello, Olivia. Hello, everybody. Yes, indeed. We have a lot of reactions on the chat line, a lot of questions for our speakers. And I'm going to start with one question for Peter. So one of our female viewers has written that you have published last year an article in Nature Communication um, to underline the diversity of different types of uh, coronavirus among bats. And if you're a, a science historian, this was a fascinating paper because it was submitted before COVID-19 hit us. So the question is, can you kindly tell us what were the major lines of that article when you submitted it for the very first time? Well, it's very interesting. Um, when we submitted it, this was the... Uh, the um, big paper from many years of work, and we found 630 completely new uh, coronavirus sequences in bats in China. And of course, we didn't know this, but one of those sequences is now the closest known to SARS-CoV-2. Um, so it's funny when you look back on this at the time, it was just another, yet another sequence from bats, a genetic code of a virus that we didn't know what the importance was. And now we, we, we think it, it, it could be related closely to SARS-CoV-2. What the paper really tells us though, is something much more important than that. It tells us that there are many, many viruses in wildlife um, and that you know most of them probably if they emerged wouldn't cause a pandemic, but some of them do. So we can make a choice right now. We can either continue carrying on with our activities of, con of constantly building 
high-speed rail networks that link um, rural China to central China, to Myanmar, to Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and, and just carry on and hope for the best. Or we can continue this work and look at what these viruses are like and say some of these could be dangerous, some of these could be risky. So let's work with the communities where these viruses exist and teach them about their relationship with nature and try and block the transmission. Pandemics can be disrupted, um, just like any major issue, but not if we don't do anything about it. If we just sit here and wait, that is not the strategy. I think that's the real message of that paper. Thank you very much, Peter, for your answer. I am now going to put a question to Letitia. So as we have seen since last year, the scientific community has been really on board working on COVID-19. You, as a member of the Scientific Council, could you come back in a few words about the mission that your Scientific Council had and its role in the management of the crisis? Thank you very much for this question. Yes, indeed. As a researcher at the IRD and specialist specializing in uh, anthropology uh, and public health, I had the great fortune, or the misfortune, whichever you like, of uh, being appointed to this COVID-19 uh, Scientific Council in March last year. Let me uh, come back on what Peter was saying a minute ago about the links between science and politics uh, in this uh, period. It, and this is, um, what I'm talking about is not specific to France. Many countries have appointed COVID-19 scientific councils with the same job, i.e. of shedding light uh, for the health authorities on the response that uh, is required for COVID-19. 19. And it will be really important. I totally echo what Peter was saying. It will be really very important in coming months and years to take a look back at what the scientific councils in France and elsewhere about vaccination and all the other issues, what they were able to do and were not able to do during the pandemic. And international cooperation will be future, uh, so essential in the, in the future. There's a very strong image from the past, which was put forward by Peter earlier on, saying that, uh, not, not saying the forest is over there, go and have a look at it, but also to react and share, share what has been done. And that's what we need to do in our uh, councils. The role that were given to the councils, the roles that the councils took upon themselves, their freedom of, uh, of maneuver, their choice of whether they wanted to be transparent or not, that was different from one country to the next, and the links with the population. So. In, in France, it will be wonderful to take the French population by the hand and stroll through the forest with them to explain what uh, research is doing during a crisis and what research can do, cannot do. Well, the same for the politics. We've all understood how science uh, is, uh, is riddled with, with many incertitudes because there are many unanswered questions. But science is is modest, takes the time to reflect, makes announcements and reiterates these uh, these uncertitudes. It's very, very difficult to, to convey this and uh, to tie it in with politics. So that was uh, my answer in a, in, a, in a nutshell. So these links between science and politics, so there's that long time scale of research compared to the very short term demands in times of crisis um, means that the, these debates, these controversies in the scientific community on a whole range of subjects, whether uh, that have hit the, the news. And it really is imp important to look back on all of those subjects so that we can uh, keep a trace and keep the memories of what happened, but also so that we can prepare better for future health crises, whether they be epidemics or natural catastrophes or conflicts or organized violence, etc., etc. Well, thank you very much, Letitia, for your answer. Now I'm going to take a question for Francine. 
concernant le contexte so given this specific context in the Congo, what key measure would you recommend in terms of public policy to combat pandemics? Uh, the microphone hasn't been switched on. Well, goodness me, what key measure? Well, in the Congo, we really need to organize uh, research better. Research has to be multidisciplinary here. We have a lack of expertise in different fields. So we need to have multidisciplinary uh, research, solid collaboration with our partners on a regional level, that's very important, because Central Africa is a zone where epidemics of infectious disease are very, very recurrent. So we need to have better coordination in the sub-regional uh, level. So that will be a very important point. And that commitment of communities, COVID-19 has shown us very well how with the vaccination, we can see it also, that uh, the, the population really needs to be on board. The population isn't yet on board in terms of vaccination, although we've uh, been handing out vaccines left, right and centre, the population is refusing to get vaccinated. And science must communicate better and uh, bring in those different disciplines. The socio-anthropologists need to be uh, involved. So that would be my recommendation in terms of, of your question. Pl many disciplines all involved, better uh, in involvement of the communities, etc. And uh, sub-regional coordination, because here again, we've realized that the health system is very fragile. But with good coordination, it is possible to, uh, to move forward and to be better prepared. Communication is so important, really important. There we go. Thank you, Francine, for your answer. So I will now take a question for Gerardo. A few days ago, uh, we saw that Mexico became the first country in Latin America to join the Prezod initiative. Can you tell us uh, what makes the specificity of Mexico's participation in this initiative? Hello. Well, this is a, a very nice opportunity to be the first uh, country to collaborate in this Prezod initiative made by the French government. And this is very nice because it, it, it is... Uh, uh, fits together perfect with the project we are working on, the El Dorado, but also fits with the projects we want to develop in a short, medium, and long term. So Presot uh, and Mexico's uh, point in Mérida, Yucatán, will be a, a, a point of collaboration, a center of excellence, and, and a center for making a nice web uh, of communication in, in all the continent with different uh, countries. So in, in that sense, we are following the, the way to prevent, to monitor the, our relation with nature, to identify pathogens, but also to have a, a, a reactive, uh, a fast reactive uh, action uh, in a case of an emergence can uh, be in, the, in whatever country in, in, in Latin America. So I guess this is a nice opportunity for Mexico and for local, regional, and continental scale. This is very nice to be part of this Presot initiative. Merci à vous, Gerardo. Thank you, Gerardo. So uh, we are uh, coming close to the end of the program. So I've got one last question for Benjamin. Should we cure animals before humans in Sahelian Africa? And how can animals be in contact with diseases? 
ça dépend aussi de ce well, qu'on entend par le it terme all depends soigner, on what you mean by euh, curing animals, euh, treating animals. You need to understand that uh, the pathogens are very important engineers in ecosystems. If there are no more pathogens in ecosystems, then biodiversity will be reduced. So some pathogens will take over and replace the ones that we've eliminated. Pathogens are a community, so there's a balance that's very difficult to maintain. So we need to have a good level of protection of ecosystems to ensure that dangerous pathogens uh, do not uh, become too frequent and threaten human populations. But uh, at the same time, if we could exterminate all pathogens uh, in our ecosystems, then other pathogens would emerge. And uh, the, this would only mean uh, pushing the problem away. And we do not know what would emerge when we you start develop. We started developing vaccines and eradicated uh, smallpox. We thought this would be the end of infectious diseases, and that there would be one vaccine for everything, and that uh, this was the end of history. There were uh, vaccines against smallpox, tuberculosis. We thought we would develop um, vaccines against every disease. And since then, we've entered an era of emergence of infectious diseases with HIV, Ebola, uh, other influencers. Uh, influenza remains uh, very present across all continents. Then there's been uh, all sorts of zoonoses that emerged, SARS-CoV, uh, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, all the coronaviruses, and uh, the list goes on and on. So we've really moved from a world where we had major diseases that were very contagious. We've managed to eradicate some of them, and new ones have emerged. Uh, we, we've called them emerging diseases. So what we need to try to do is develop strategies that can allow us to reduce interactions between human populations and, wild, and wildlife or domesticated animals to ensure that these animals who are in contact with human populations are uh, less infected by fewer pathogens, but we cannot eradicate all of them. So there's really a very difficult balance that we need to find. And this is where science has solutions to bring to determine uh, achievable solutions and then work with uh, decision makers and with the various stakeholders in society to see which of these solutions can be implemented in real life. Thank you very much, Benjamin. I'm going to hand the floor back to Olivier to wrap up. Well, thank you very much once again to all of our guests. We have now come to the end of this program. We know now that human health is inextricably linked to the environment in its broadest sense, the physical, ecological and social dimensions of planet Earth. The COVID-19 pandemic is presented everywhere as a human problem because it impacts humans. But in order to find long-term solutions and prevent future crises, it's urgent to broach this pandemic with an integrated approach. And that's what One Health does. So political and scientific action seem to be underway, notably through Prezode uh, and uh, the COVID-19 Memoriam. But uh, it's really important to have an interdisciplinary research. It's a common challenge for all humans. It's a duty of modesty. We need to end our anthropocentric vision of diseases and completely rethink the relationship between humans and non-humans. Well, I hope you enjoyed this program. I would like really to thank the very many people who've helped to prepare it. And I would like to thank our guests once again, particularly as Peter and Gerardo, who have uh, joined us from at a very early hour for them in Mexico and the United States. If you'd like to find out more about this program, you can take a look at our website, www.ird.fr/hello-world, And I'll be seeing you in October for our next program. It'll be all about biodiversity. So hope to see you then. Until then, we're all citizens of planet Earth. Let's not forget to do our part. See you soon.